Good to see you guys this evening. Do me a favor, turn to your neighbor and tell them one thing that you appreciate about them. You guys are already feeling awkward, yeah? Let's have a good conversation. Have a good conversation with your neighbor. What do you appreciate about them? How blessed are you with their relationship in your life? Turn to your other neighbor. Tell them how good God is. Talk to them about how good God is. How good God is in your life, right? Come on. How many of you here are thankful for the relationship that you have with God's people and our relationship with God himself? Can we just give God some praise for that, man? You know, we continue to talk about the ongoing narrative of this season that we've been in over the last 22 months. I just want to say first and foremost that it is so inspiring and encouraging to see so many people, so many of you folks, so many of us continue on in our life, continue to believe for God to do great things in and through us, and continue to live out the purpose and destiny that God has for us. I know this has not been an easy stretch. I know many of us, like, this has been life. All of us, this has been life for a very, very long time, but we still have faith for what's to come. We still have faith that God is good. We still have faith that he'll provide. We still have faith that our lives here on earth are going to have just great impact and meaning, not just for our life, but lives around us. Like, we are living in a very amazing time right now. Whether or not we see it, we will experience it one day. And we will know and witness the glory of what God wanted to reveal to the world in a season like this. So just sit back and relax and just know as we're watching all of this unfold, as we're watching the moment where we have some form of normalcy where we can return, our lives will never be the same. And that's not a bad thing. That is a great thing. It is a wonderful thing because we're going to learn in this season, like we never would have had in any other season, the importance of being connected to God, remaining in God, and abiding in him. Amen. That's the series that we're talking about tonight. That's what we're going to be going over this evening. The title of tonight's message is The Freedom Our Soul Desires. I say that because we're going to be talking about Jesus and how Jesus is the freedom that every single one of us, whether we realize it or not, we are searching for freedom. We crave freedom. freedom. We desire freedom. And we will never truly experience what freedom is and looks like until we have a relationship with Jesus. Even that term freedom is just something that, like, conceptually, we can all have, like, our own idea of what freedom is. Right? Freedom could be like not having anything to do in, in the day. Right? Just having a whole day to just watch TV and eat whatever you want and sleep in and just kind of just cruise. Some of us, freedom looks like when you're at your favorite beach all by yourself and no one can bother you and you can have that quiet time that you're looking for. Some of us, freedom looks like just being out with friends 24-7 and enjoying and making memories. Some of us, freedom is just being able to just have a good night's rest and sleep. Because the days are tough, right? Like, we all have this whole concept of what freedom looks like to us. But tonight, we're going to look at what God's word says freedom is. It's a completely different concept and mindset when we know what the living word, Jesus Christ, says freedom looks like and is. And that we're called to have that on this side of eternity. Before we dive into the words, and I just want to share kind of this monumental moment that I've uh, stepped, in, stepped into in this season. This may not mean a whole lot to you, but for myself and my wife, Chantel, like this is a, this is a pretty big moment that I chose to take a step into over the last couple of months. Um, if you're in my small group or if you're a close friend, you may have known that for the last year I've been wrestling whether or not I should go to counseling. Like, this was something that God has birthed on my heart from the beginning of last year. And I was like, man, I I think I need to. I mean, we're all a work in progress. We're all journeying through life. We're all experiencing how this pandemic has affected us individually, relationally, you know. And there was just, like, this moment where I realized, like, man, like, it is tough. And it's not like life was bad, but I just started realizing that in this season of the pandemic, in just the life phase that I'm in, like, God was surfacing things from my childhood and from my past. And I was like, man, like, I I think God is allowing all of these things to surface now because he wants me to address it. And I literally went a whole year, like, talking about whether or not I should take a step and and go to, you know, counseling. I was like, man, I, I have a lot of, like, things to do and all this stuff to be at and this and that. And, you know, I had a lot of excuses. They weren't always bad. But I just had them, and I never took that step. But uh, ending of 2021 and going on into the first few weeks of this year, I've been going to counseling, and it's been so life-giving. I just want to say that first and foremost. Sometimes there's a stigma, like, oh, you don't need that. You shouldn't be doing that. But 
I'm just so grateful and thankful for one, a church that allows young people to have a place and a space to feel safe, to talk, to be in service like this, come as you are, have small groups, have mentors and leaders and pastors and just grow in our walk. And then we also have like this encouragement, you know, to just take those kinds of steps that you need to take. And I began my counseling and it's just, it's just been life-giving. You know, I get to share a little bit with my wife and with some of my close friends and, and my pastors and leaders what God is revealing about things from my childhood and narratives from my childhood that I didn't know still affect me to this day. And this pursuit of freedom, though, and that's, it's just like this crazy week to be talking about, like, freedom in Christ and knowing that I'm also beginning to experience this newfound freedom through counseling. And it's Christian counseling, so we go over scripture, we pray. You know, it's, it's the counselor that I, I meet with is, is just like, he doesn't say much, and he makes me talk. And I can talk a lot, as you guys know. And like, beyond or before all of it is done, like, I'm just weeping and crying because I'm like, how did you not saying anything and me talking and like just the Holy Spirit dropping in, like, lead me to that moment where like something from my childhood came up and now we're talking about how God's called me to live in freedom despite of what happened. It's powerful. It's amazing. And I go back to this whole topic of, like, what this message tonight is. Like, this isn't a message that we take lightly. Like, freedom is something we all desire. And like I said, we all have concepts of what freedom looks like or smells like or sounds like to us. But then there's also God's view of freedom that trumps all of that. And why? Because it involves Jesus Christ himself. So I share this part about my life because this is my journey that I'm on that many of us are in, knowing that, yes, we live in a fallen and broken world, but our God is so good. And he wants to bring healing for today and tomorrow, but he also wants us to experience healing and breakthrough and freedom from our past as well. And there's nothing that you've been through. There's nothing that you've experienced. There's nothing that you've done or others that have done to you that would make God look at you any less than the son and daughter of Christ that you are in his eyes. This whole concept of freedom, it's not just a word, it's a lifestyle. It's inside. That's the kind of freedom that God is after for every single one of us. And I hope all of us, encouraged by God's word and what God is doing in all of our lives, can leave here more encouraged, knowing that, we're, yeah, we're all on a journey of faith. But, man, each step of the way gets better because of who Jesus is. Amen? Can I pray for us before we open up with uh, the opening passage tonight? Lord, Thank you so much for every son and daughter that's in this house. God, you love them so much. And you are so grateful and thankful that they chose to be in your house. But we are reminded, Lord, that the church is not a building. It's your people. So even when we leave this place, God, your spirit and your presence and your truth is with us as we go. And as we talk about what the Bible says, what your living word says freedom is, Lord, I pray that we would take that freedom everywhere that we go. Lord, you have not called us to live in bondage. You have not called us to be slaves to sin. God, you've called us to be set free. So, Lord, may your word give us precedence of what freedom is, and may we step into freedom every single day of our life. His name is Jesus, Lord, and may his name reign supreme tonight, God. May joy and excitement, God, fill this place. May hope arise. In Jesus' name, we all said, amen. Passage we're going to be reading out tonight is John 8, 31 to 36. We're going to do something a little different tonight. We're going to break down this passage in three points, and we're going to read it in chunks, two uh, passages by two passages, two, two passages each point, and we're going to see what God's word is specifically saying to all of us in John 8, 31 to 36. So I'm going to read it for all of us. And again, this is Jesus giving an answer to what freedom is and who freedom comes from. It goes like this. And again, we'll break it down with more context. But it begins with this. To the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, If you hold to me and my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Let's set this passage up a little bit. First and foremost, the people that is talking to Jesus at this time, they're actually trying to challenge him. They're called Pharisees. Pharisees were people that knew God's word, they knew the Old Testament, they knew the law and the rule of what it meant to be a follower of God, but they had no heart change and heart transformation. And they're talking to Jesus, and Jesus is saying, like, man, I am the truth, and I will set you free. These people are trying to be like, dude, 
okay, you're Jesus, you're this guy. How do we truly know that you're going to set us free? How do we truly know that you are the Son of God? How do we truly know what you say is what God is trying to speak? There's like this, this tension in the air. And these people are trying to challenge Jesus' view of freedom and truth, which comes from him. And they're trying to deny him of that. They're trying to prove him wrong. They're trying to challenge Jesus himself. Like, just kind of picture that moment for yourself. But then he goes on and on and on. He says, like, no, like, if you truly are my disciples, if you truly abide and remain in me, you will then be set free. This is the gift that I give you. Not the law of the Old Testament, but Christ himself here, right here in the New Testament. Like, I will set you free. And we're going to look at what that kind of means and kind of what that means for all of us tonight. But I want us to wrestle with that just right off the bat. God says straight, first and foremost, through Jesus, I will set you free. But all that sin that you're entangled with, all of that addictions, all of that anger, all of that lust, all of that greed, all of that unforgiveness, that will cause you to be a slave because that's what sin does. It enslaves us. It causes us to feel like somehow we're in control, but in reality, sin is actually in control of us. And when does the sin in our life ever lead to like better relationships or God's glory being revealed and just our lives being better? It never does. Sin never ever does that. And that's why Jesus says the only way to be set free is through me. And guess what? When you are set free through me, you are invited into my family, my house, God's house, his people. Whom the son sets free is free indeed. Many of us, again, like we've, place our lives on earth for other things of this world. And we've been living lives of just trying to just make a name for ourselves and like serve ourselves or serve other people. And it's so draining and so tiring, so unfulfilling, not satisfying, so hurtful, so painful, right? But imagine knowing that Jesus has set you free and you are part of his family, not just because you're perfect, but because he accepts you as you are and you become part of a journey of life here on earth of understanding more and more about who this Jesus guy is and how much he radically loves you. I'm 16 years into my walk. I'm still in this process of knowing God more every single day. This whole season that I've been in getting counseling, like that's just revealed more and more of what sin has done in my life. But it's also revealing more and more of what God wants to do in and through it instead. And I want to choose freedom over my life. I'll talk about some of the areas that I've been wrestling with and struggling with. It's probably some things that you're going through as well, experiencing as well. We're all fallen and broken. So grateful and thankful for Jesus. I'm so grateful and thankful that we have a house like this, a church like this, where you can come as you are and know that you will never leave the same. And that's okay. That is absolutely okay. So Jesus is the eternal freedom our soul desires. And in John 8, 31 to 36, Jesus teaches three things. And we're, again, going to look at it point by point. He sets us free from our sin that enslaves us. He calls us to move forward from the pains of our past. And lastly, he invites us to trust his everlasting promise over our life. We're not going to be adding much more passages or scriptures tonight. This passage itself speaks for itself, and we're going to talk about things Verse by verse, again, your first point tonight, our first point tonight. He sets us free from our sin that enslaves us. Verse 31 to 32. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. There's a difference between knowing who Jesus is and knowing what that means for your life. And there's a very, very big difference in what it is to live that way. You ever, like, kind of, like, tell, like, you meet people, yeah? Like, oh, I work out. And you kind of, like, are you sure? Right? And you just kind of, I mean, like, I, you know, we're all, you know, don't judge. But, like, sometimes it's just, you know, like, like, it's clear. Like, are you sure? Right? Oh, like, I'm a very studious student. I do well in school. And they're, like, the very one skipping class constantly. They never, like, log in on Zoom because that's, like, the more recent thing. Or you realize that they're never in class. It's kind of a contradiction, Right? Or how about like all of us like, oh man, like I'm just such a carefree, like fun-loving person. But if you make me angry, like, ooh, I switch on a dime. That's me. That last one, and maybe the first two too, but that first one, or the last one I meant, like that's me. 
I can come off like just cool and collected, like, man, like, I love God, I love Jesus, and I absolutely do. It's been 16 years of my life. Thank you for his grace. We'll talk about that more in point three. But I know what God's word says about anger, and I know what God's word says about unforgiveness. I know his word, although it causes me to wrestle. I'll read some passages that speak to me about that area in particular, anger. I know what God's word says. But in my flesh, sometimes I don't live that way. In my flesh, sometimes my anger from my childhood comes up right now at 32. In different circumstances and situations, like, man, like, I may not be intimidating to you, but when anger, like, just comes out, and Satan wants to do that in all of us, he doesn't want us to live our lives with the glory of God and the freedom that God wants to provide us and give us as a gift, but he wants us to be entangled in sin. So every time I give into my anger and I do things out of my anger, I know that it brings destruction. Like I absolutely know that it does. So it's so frustrating sometimes that I do that constantly over and over and over. Like you, you ever get that way like with areas of your life? Like man, like I know what God's word says about this, but man, like I keep giving into it time and time again. Like why, right? Here's the beautiful thing, though, about God. He sent his son Jesus for those very things that we struggle with every day. And he still loves us immensely. He still loves us wholeheartedly. And he still paves the way for us every day to live in his grace with the promise of heaven and eternity where all of the mess of this world will be redeemed. Because we'll see Jesus face to face. Like, just think about that. His word says that. The truth will set you free. That means, though, you got to get into your word, right? You got to get into your Bible. Sunday night cannot be the only time that you read about scripture. Your small group, right, and you go over the guy, like, what stood out to you for the first point and main passages every week? Like, it's the same question every time, but that cannot be your word. That can be your discussion for a small group, but that's not going to sustain you for the rest of your life. You need God's word in you because, again, it convicts us. Yes, Jesus convicts us. That's a good thing. We don't want tension. We don't want to be told we're doing something wrong. We don't want to be called out for, for errors in of our life that we know aren't good. But Jesus does it, but not to condemn. He does it because he loves us like a father would to a son and daughter in love and in truth. So, again, I wrestle, right, with this area of anger. Like, dude, like, again, I can turn on a dime. And I've seen what my anger can do in the beginnings of my walk with God and even in the present day. Like, it's not something I'm proud of, but it's something I know I'm journeying in. And I'm accountable to God. I'm accountable with people I process with. I'm accountable to my wife who has to see it and choose to love me despite it. Like, man, it's such a powerful and freeing thing to know that you are unconditionally loved, right? Right? But when I first started coming to church, there's these two scriptures that I remember I came across regarding this area of anger, and it just spoke to me so loud. Like, it doesn't even get any more clearer than this in terms of how we're supposed to respond to anger and how we're supposed to respond to unforgiveness. And usually, anger and unforgiveness are tied together. Like, it just goes hand in hand. You can't be angry at someone that you have forgiven. And you can't forgive someone that you're still angry at. And here we are in life still living that tension day to day to day, which is why we need Jesus, because only by his grace could we do either or and both and. Let me read you what God's word says. Ephesians, it's not in your notes, but again, this is from my own personal devotions, things that I have like, I don't know if like this is just me, but I actually write down like scriptures that like speak to me on like flashcards and I have it like in my car. I have them like in my room. I have it like in my devotions, like I have them. So... When you read God's word, just know he'll speak to you. And if it speaks to you that much, write it down. Like, don't just ponder it for like a minute and then just be like, oh, I'm hungry. You know, like, or like Netflix or like, oh, like beach. You know, like just like sit in it, like marinate in it and let it speak to you. So I came into my walk with God and, and I knew I was an angry kid. Like I was a quiet kid, but I was an angry one. And the quiet ones are always the most angry, just letting you know, Okay. Ephesians 4, 26 to 27, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. Where's the root of my anger? It's not God, it's Satan himself. It's this person out there that wants to destroy our lives here on earth and not want us to encounter the love of God and live in that freedom and share that freedom and love with other people. 
And then if that doesn't get any better, a few lines later on forgiveness. Again, Ephesians 4, 32. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. And this isn't like two different passages from two different books that just speak about two different things that are kind of related. This is literally one wavelength out of Ephesians, where the author of Ephesians talks about anger and unforgiveness all in one. And he addresses it in one thought. Don't go to sleep angry. Don't give the enemy a foothold and forgive people as Christ has forgiven you. Like that spoke to me so much. And I look at that, I'm like, dude, like that's what God's word does. Because my life in anger and my life in sin has enslaved me. It has caused destruction in my life and other people. But when I choose to get God's word in me, to forgive people as Christ has forgiven me, to not let anger overtake me and not let the enemy have a stronghold, but allow the grace of God and the love of God to flow in and through my life. Like, you know what that does to my life and the relationships around us, around me? It elevates it. It gives it meaning. It gives it purpose. It gives it joy. Like, we get to experience relationship with one another the way that God had intended it. Like, no, it's not perfect. Yes, we're all fallen. Yes, you will upset your neighbor. Yes, you will upset your friend. Yes, you're going to forget to respond to someone and they're going to overreact because you left it on red and they're like, why didn't you like respond? It's been like two hours, you know? Like, we've all been there. We've all been there. We're trapped by the enemy's schemes when we give into things like anger. We know it doesn't work. But the word of God, which brings the truth of God and the freedom of God, man, that gives perspective. Imagine a life that we live and others live where anger isn't the default that we turn to, but forgiveness is. We want to see the world change, right? We want things to get better, right? We're upset with the injustices that we see left and right, right? It doesn't start with and it doesn't end with anger, the only way that it'll end right is with forgiveness. God's people, has exper we've experienced forgiveness. We experience it every day that we breathe. The only logical response is extend that forgiveness to someone else. It's not easy. It's not overnight. Sometimes it's a process. But good, you have the rest of your life here on earth to enjoy that process with God. And in the process of that process, you'll see processes of relationships become better people you never thought you could enjoy having a relationship with, you can because God's word sets us free. Amen? Number two in your notes. He calls us to move forward from the pains of our past. Again, going back to the initial, initial passage we read, verses 33 to 34. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. What's interesting about these people who are talking to Jesus, the Pharisees, is they say, like, we've never been slaves before. Like, who are you to tell us that you need to set us free? But here's the thing about the Israelites, who are the ancestors of the present-day Jews and also the Pharisees at the time. Like, they were constantly enslaved in the Old Testament. And, like, it boggles my mind that they forgot that or, like, they missed that. Like, if you read through the Old Testament, you know that the Israelites constantly turn from God and his plan and will over their life. And they kind of like worship the golden calf or like they like, it's, it's like true. You got to read it. It's pretty interesting. Like they did all of these things in the Old Testament where you knew they were turning from the will of God and the plans of God and the love of God. And every time that they did it, they got enslaved by another like country and nation. Like it's in the Old Testament. And yet these people who say that they know the law and they know God's word, like they are saying like, we've never been slaves We've been alive for 400 years, or maybe 40 years at the time. People didn't live that old in the New Testament. But that's okay. Like, for the point of this, like, they're like, that wasn't us. You ever realize that that's how we can be too? Like, I don't struggle with anything. Like, I'm good. Like, you know, like, you talk with people, like, that they're having, like, a rough time, right? This is okay. We've all been there. I've been there myself. Like, like for instance, my wife, Chantal, does this all the time. Like, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm okay. Yeah, I'm fine. What's wrong with you? You know, like, like, I can get like that, right? Sometimes we don't want to admit the fact that, man, we need help, man. Man, like, I'm struggling, dude. I'm having a hard time in this area of my life. My schooling, my health, my mental, my emotional health, this situation, this circumstance, this pandemic, this surge, like, man, like, are you really good? 
Are you just pretending? And maybe they were pretending, maybe they forgot, but if they forgot, were they really the Pharisees that they said they were? If they forgot, like, scripture, like, that was kind of what they did. But they forgot where they came from. So maybe they didn't know, or they didn't want to acknowledge it, or worse, they forgot where they came from. We do that way too much with God. Like, when life is good and things are good, like, man, I'm good, God. Thank you for what you've done. I'll see you next year when things are rough. That's not how God wants us to be. Like, he's not our genie in the bottle. He's the Savior and Lord over our life that just wants relationship with us. He doesn't want perfection. He doesn't want works. He doesn't want religion out of us. He wants relationship from us. Did we not know? Are we too prideful to say? Or did we just simply forget how good God has been before, where he met us at our lowest, where he brought us to our highest, And when he met us each step of the way, like, I've had so many friends, and this is something that bothers me to say, but I have so many friends that I grew up in youth ministry with, loving God, praising God, like, hype for God, like, just living our best life. And then, like, in our 30s now, like, they're just just not here. It breaks my heart. It really does. And one of my passions, like, like, if you just talk to me, like, I'm just like, I just want everyone in our college and young adults ministry to grow grow old and love God every year of their life. Partly the reason why I want to see that happen in you folks is because I lost that with my peers and friends. And I'm so committed just in the season that I'm called to lead this or be part of this. Probably be called for a long time. Like I just can't see myself doing anything else. But I'm so committed to seeing young people and all of us grow into our 20s, our 30s, our 40s, our 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s and beyond just knowing how much God loves us. And not forgetting like these Pharisees did or, or trying to pretend like everything's okay. Like, imagine living a life of freedom because of Christ into the last days of your life. Like, I know that's a little morbid to think about, but imagine how beautiful your life is going to be. Imagine your marriage. Imagine the family that you have. Imagine the career that you're going to live. Imagine the places you're going to go. Imagine the things that you're going to do. Imagine the memories you're going to make. Imagine, like, those times that you just can't stop laughing over and over and over because of how good God is and how much he blessed you and did in your life. Like, just imagine looking back on your life with that in mind. We can't do that if we don't acknowledge the fact that we need a Savior. We can't do it if we, acknowledge, if we don't acknowledge the fact that we, we need help. We can't do that if we don't acknowledge the fact that Jesus did something before. And even though it was 10 years ago, it's still something worth living for now. I can't wait for you guys to get old when you're bald when what you wear is no longer relevant. I'll be there first. I'm probably there right now. It's okay. Right? I have white hair. It's a thing. But I can't wait. I can't wait to see what our lives look like when we live in freedom for the rest of it. And it's not going to be a perfect life. It's not like things are going to be the best every single day. We're going to endure hardship. We're going to endure trial. God's word says that as well. But we never have to live in enslavement or bondage or be imprisoned in our mind, our body, our soul, because Jesus has set us free. You like when you come into worship and like that song just like, oh, like it just hits you in the heart, just hits you in the soul. You know like the song that like just is in my mind like all the time is all hail King Jesus. Like it's just like, you know, I'm just like both hands up, you know, like this just, yes, you know, like this is my moment. Like don't look at me. Just want to have a moment with God. Like, that's like, that's my song. Because when that line comes up, all hail King Jesus. One, it reminds me that he's king. And two, it reminds me of what my response is to worship him. So simple, but yet so profound and powerful at the same time. And I know there's like more lines in the song, but when that goes on and the words go on screen, like it just, yeah. You know, like, yes. You know why when we read our word or when we come into a time of worship and we have songs like this on screen, you know why that awakens us? Because there's truth in that and the truth sets us free. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, I'm set free. You are set free. I didn't mean for you to say that, but thank you. Thank you for saying that. You know what? Let's just say it. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, you are set free. But here's the, here's the reality, though. 
Like, we still have to make a choice every single day to live in freedom, right? We get up, and we can choose to live in the will and the word of God in the freedom and truth that Jesus has given us, or we can choose to live in our flesh. We can choose to respond in anger, or we can choose to respond in grace. We can choose to key the car, or we can choose to walk away, right? We can choose to judge their shoes, or we can choose, choose to not say anything. We have a choice. And you know what I love about God giving us a choice is it shows that he loves us so much that he is unwilling to make us robots here on earth. Imagine if God just programmed us to do the right thing all the time. Was that really love? But I can tell you this, it does break his heart when we choose to go the other path. But he didn't leave with a broken heart or anger. He sent his son Jesus who sets us free so we can be in relationship with God the Father here on earth for the rest of eternity over and over and over and over again. We live in a time where we are judged by our imperfections. Social media is like one of the most like, prevalent ways where we compare ourselves to what image we'd want versus the image we were created by. And we can't see the image of God in who we are because we choose to see all of the things wrong in our life, right? That's why we filter not just our Instagram, but we filter our day-to-day. -day. We put, like, little doggy ears on bad days, but we still feel it after the doggy ears are done and posted, right? Like, we've all been there. I've been there. God don't want to leave you living a filtered life. He wants you to live in freedom. Your imperfections come with the freedom. Don't be ashamed of who you are and what you've been through. That's one of the, the things that I've learned in, in my counseling, just in the few weeks that I've been doing it. Like there's still parts of me that is ashamed of my past and the things that I've endured and gone through. There's still areas in my life, in my childhood, where I say, like, that was just a dark moment, and it was just a dark moment. But somehow, someway, that dark moment was dark so that the glory and the light of Christ could be revealed. And that doesn't make that a dark moment anymore. That makes it a redeemed moment. What have you been through that God is saying, hey, let me in on that? That imperfection of your past is a beautiful opportunity for my perfection to be revealed. Step into it. Don't run from it. Run to Christ. Run to small group. Run to relationships that will hold you accountable. Run to God's word. Everything that the enemy would want is for us to run away from it. My encouragement and challenge for myself and all of us is to run to Christ, not away. Okay? Because again, if you run away now, you'll lose the years of life that God wants you to see his faithfulness in before you pass here on earth. Like, you can see, like, lives, yeah? Like, when people are on their last few days and they're, like, they were living, they lived their life, like, you can see it in their eyes. Like, you just know, like, they're, they're so joyful. They're so happy. It's almost like a celebrate, celebratory moment more than anything else. I pray that we'd all live lives like that where we would say, like, man, I did everything wasn't perfect, but I did everything I could for the glory of God. And man, like, it's a good life, but I'm stoked for heaven and eternity. Amen. Ah, oh, man. Like, I can go on and on and on about, like, this particular subject, but I can't and I won't. And I don't think you guys can listen to me for more than at least 45 minutes. So let's close things up tonight. Number three in your notes. Final point, and then we'll have kind of a response moment for us. The last two verses of that passage we read earlier. Jesus, he invites us to trust his everlasting promise over our life. Verse 35 to 36. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. You remember like that post-it or, um, well, I do have a lot of post-its too. Buy me post-its, that would make me really happy. But that and flashcards, like I have scriptures on it all the time. That's another one of those passages that just I always fall back on. Like, Because we always feel orphaned a little bit, right? 
Like we'll always feel a little outcasted. We'll always feel a little orphaned. We'll always feel a little unaccepted. We'll always feel like a little like outside of the box and not fully understood. And that's totally fine because you're unique and God made you a certain way. So don't expect to fully like kind of flow with like the grain of society. You're not supposed to. But we always kind of feel that way and then we live that way. Like we're orphans. The whom the son says free is free indeed. A permanent place in the family. Like, get this word in your soul. You have a permanent place in God's family. Like, permanent is permanent. Like, permanent. You know what I mean? Like, it's permanent. Permanent? Yeah, I said that a lot. Permanent markers on this earth, that is not the permanent we're talking about, right? Like, over time, a permanent marker will fade. You will see what's on the other side of what you, like, blocked out. That is not the kind of permanent that we're trying to talk about. A permanent place in a family is a permanent place in a family here on earth and in heaven because of what Jesus did for us. And I know, like, we live, right? Many of us, we've grown up in broken homes. I grew up in a broken home. So what does a family even look like? What does that mean? Why is it necessary? Because I never wanted to be part of mine. So you're asking me to be part of a permanent family for eternity? Like, that's kind of, that's, that's a long time, you know? But God's family... And guess what? His family isn't just for us. It's for others, too. Just think about it. You can ex- be excited, like, in your own walk with God. That's awesome and amazing. But there's nothing more better to see other people come into a relationship with God when they experience the freedom for themselves. Man, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, it is the best thing ever. You ever, like, like a friend asks you, like, hey, can I come over for dinner? And then you're like, no. <laughs> you don't want to come to my house for dinner, trust me. It's awkward. It's tense. Maybe some of you guys have great, you know, like, yeah, yeah come over, potluck style. Just sleep over for the weekend if you want. But, like, that wasn't me. Like, you want to come over to my Can I come over to yours, actually? Like, can I sleep over forever? Like, just make me a room, you know? God's family, you can be so confident in. You got to get on this. Come to my house. Come to my church. Come to my small group. Come to, like, the place I like to eat and talk story with people at. Like, you can come with me to Zippy's. Like, I'm always down for Zippy's. You can come with me to Saito and Fa. I love Saito and Fa in Eva Beach. You can come to me wherever I eat because I obviously love eating. So just come with me and let's just talk story. Come to my house. Because where I am, Jesus is. Because God calls his people the church. And wherever I am, I guess I'm the church. So Jesus is there too. Come, come with. Our lives, nah, it's not just for ourselves. It's absolutely 100% for other people. But the both and is what brings purpose to our life. Jesus came for one, like us individually. But he came for the world corporately and forever. Like think of, it's like the small and the big. Invite people to the small moments of your life with God. And invite people to the big moments in your life with God too. Both very valid moments for them to encounter God. Amen? I know tonight's message was a little different than most ways we kind of go through a message. But I just hope you hear the heart of what is being shared and like the heart of God's word. Like we, we literally only went over six verses. Like some of us can't even like focus on something for six minutes. That's Okay. But I challenge all of us, like, let this word speak to you more than just tonight's service. Read it. Like, marinate on it. Let it speak to you and engage with you because this passage is talking about freedom. Our souls desire it. Our souls want it. We crave it. We have images of it. But none of those images can fulfill what only Christ can fulfill in our soul of what freedom truly is. It's knowing that we are so fallen and so broken. We've been through so much. And yes, every time we've chosen sin, it has made things worse. And that is the enslavement that leads us to destruction, not just here on earth, but for eternity. But yet Jesus still came to this earth to live the life we should have lived and died the death that we deserve so that we could have hope every single day here on this side of eternity for that side of eternity and experience freedom through that. Like this church, like, and I know like, you know, we didn't really get to talk too much. I encourage you, like, sometimes come to the morning services. Like, this morning, one of the uncles of our church, his name is Frank Aguan. I know I'm not pronouncing it correctly, but his last name, to me, is Frank Aguan, okay? 
but he shared something so powerful this, this morning about his life and what he's been through. You got to watch it. You got to see that God is doing more in not just our demographic in our age, but all ages, all families, all households. Like I was literally in tears as he was sharing what he was, because I never would have thought he went through that. He's like one of the welcome guys in the morning services, always smiling, always asking questions, like just like, dude, like you smile way too much. Like that's just like what I think in my mind, okay? Like why is he still smiling? It's been like five minutes, you know, like it's a long time. But when you hear what he's been through, it makes you realize like he smiles so much because he knows what joy is in Christ, despite what he's been through, despite what he did that affected other people's lives. That's why I love our church. This isn't like a place where it's just like, oh, like pristine perfection, like, yeah, awesome. You'll hear stories on stage, but most importantly, in the relationships you have here of just people that have, everyday people that love God and God has loved them and their lives are different. We're not a flashy church. Like, just look at our building. Like, we got a lot of work to do to make it look a little bit more friendly for our age. You know, I'm just saying, okay? Side note. But we're not a flashy church, but we're in a relational, we're a relational one. We're not a perfect one, but we're an honest one. We're not the best one, but what church is? We just want to be the best that we can be for the glory of God and for others because God has set us free and he wants to set others free too. Amen? Worship team um, or our keys can come up. But we're going to do this uh, before we close out tonight. I have like this passage that I want all of us to kind of read through. It'll be on your notes, but I'm actually going to be reading it aloud for all of us. And we've done this a few times, but I find it very healthy and helpful that before we dive sometimes into God's word, like it's good for us to like kind of center ourselves and quiet our soul and quiet our spirit. And then we're going to let this word speak to us in what I feel is like a very, not creative way because I've decided on how to do it, but creative because God is a creative God. Amen. And he wants to speak to us creatively through his word in creative ways in our life. And I pray that this passage will give us perspective on who God is, how much he loves you, and how much he'll accept you despite what you've been through, what you've done, what you're doing, or what you will do. Amen. It's this passage from John 7, 5, uh, 5 or J John 7, 8 to 11. It's a very simple passage. It's this story about this woman who was caught in adultery. And at the time, if you were caught in adultery, just the law of the Old Testament meant you could have been stoned to death. They could have taken your life in that moment because what you did was a capital offense. And there's these Pharisees, these people, and they knew the word, like they knew the law. And they saw what happened to this woman and they want to judge her and they want to hate on her. They want to cancel her and most importantly, they want to kill her because of what she did. And then Jesus just so happens to be in the area, as he always is. He always finds the right time to be present, right? And then he shows them what freedom really is. He shows them how much he loves us despite what we've been through. Not because we're perfect, but because he sees what we're going through and he doesn't want that for us. Jesus wants to set us free. Whatever it is that you struggle with, whatever it is that enslaves you, whatever sin that you wrestle with, God wants to set you free, and his name is Jesus Christ. And this passage and this scripture gives us such a beautiful example of what Jesus has done for me and for us and for you time and time again, and he'll never stop doing this. When the world will want to cancel you because of what you've done wrong, God says, I want to lift you up because I want to do right in your life. Can we close our eyes and bow our heads? Do this with me, please. <laughs> I want us to take one deep breath in and one deep breath out. One deep breath in, one deep breath out. One deep breath in. One deep breath out. One deep breath in. One deep breath out. I want you to fix your eyes on Jesus. Just imagine him speaking to you, looking at you, loving on you. And I'm going to read this passage for us. And as I read it, I want it to be like 
the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, that he's going to give you the imagery. He's going to show you what was going on. He's going to give you insight on the emotions and the feelings of what this woman was going through and what the Pharisees were going through and what he was going through. I believe that he wants to personalize this passage for us. So focus in. They went each to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placing her in the midst, they said to Jesus, teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now when the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. This is not in scripture, but I just want to say that woman could be any of us. Caught in the most painful moments of our life. Facing persecution from anyone and everyone, yet Jesus says this to us. Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go. And from now on, sin no more. You can take a look up here. A lot of people think, scholars believe, that what Jesus was doing was he was writing the Ten Commandments on the ground. All of these things that people weren't supposed to do. Then he looks at all of these people that wanted to judge this woman. And he says, if any of you have never done any of these things... If any of you here are without sin, then cast the first stone. And they hear this moment. They have this moment. This woman must have been so afraid. And then one by one, these people walk away. And then Jesus looks at this woman and he says, Has anyone casted a stone? Has anyone condemned you? And then she says, No. And then he's like, Well, I don't either. So go live your life and sin no more. Here's what's powerful about this. If anyone had the right to cast a stone who was without sin, it was Jesus himself. He was the only one that had that right. Yet instead of doing what they thought he would do, he did the absolute opposite in love and grace and truth. And he speaks to this woman who is probably going through a hard time, probably going through hardship and trial, probably stuck in a season that many of us have been in in our life as well. And instead of judging and condemning, he lifts her up. Is grace a license to sin? Absolutely not. We need to wrestle with the word every day to choose to follow this amazing Jesus in the path that he's called us to. But that gives us insight that what freedom looks like is that moment with Jesus. I love you. I will not hurt you. I will not condemn you. So give, give, live your life with me part of it. People believe that she was probably part of the early church that laid their life down for the gospel. And Jesus, that's us tonight. We've been that woman. I've been there myself. And every time God has said, my freedom is yours because I love you. So live your life to the end of the days with that in mind. Let's pray. God, as we go into this time of worship, Lord, I just ask you that you would silence the lies that are already beginning to speak to some of us. These lies from the devil himself that say that we're not worthy or we're not good enough or we're, we're not that woman that could be loved by God. We're not that man that can be loved by God. But Lord, your word speaks. 
Your work is freeing and it gives us truth and the truth will set us free. So Lord, as we go into this time of worship and you do whatever you're gonna do tonight, God, I pray that we would respond tonight with words of faith, worship of faith, this moment of faith, and we would allow, Lord God, your word to transform us from the inside out, inside out, God, not for a temporary service of freedom, but a lifestyle and rhythm of freedom every single day of our life. God, you love every person here. You've seen what they've been through. You've had them in the moments where they felt like it was the end, but God, you brought them out. And that's what freedom is, Lord Jesus, is coming out of the darkness and into the light of who you are. So God, may worship and praise tonight not just be something we do, but something that we we worship and praise from the pits of our soul that comes out through our mouth that reaches heaven God knowing Lord that you are also here on earth with us God come on in and we step Lord God into this time of freedom for our freedom and the freedom of others that you've called us to love that you've called us to be with God we stand tonight we can all stand we stand tonight Lord God and we worship you with our whole heart in Jesus name we all said Amen and amen. Let's sing. Let's praise God.